Okay, so this paper is called Out of Light, Out of Nothingness, Conjuring the Chiasma and Airy Spectatorship in the work of Janet Cardiff, Derek Jarman and Barbara Hepworth. In Derek Jarman's seminal film Blue in 1993, no images exist except for an azure screen which, which appears to momentarily shiver and sparkle. Patches of light, holes, sejuras, vanishing spaces, call these what you will, but the richest kind of visual experience is one that is, is oriented towards the things we cannot see, the things we invent in our minds, with through our bodies. As we shall see in this paper, air and light, dust, and residual traces of materiality are key to the ways in which we experience the work of Jarman, Cardiff, and Hepworth. We might call this kind of spectatorship an airy gaze, a kind of looking in which the senses of the viewer are called upon and the spaces of air and breath conjure a different kind of visual and audio pleasure. Out of light, out of nothingness, such mystical works raise fascinating questions about the politics of vision, gendered subjectivity, and the ethics of a more restorative or hopeful spectatorship. The theme of this paper is directly inspired by the Dust Institute's installation and Afklint's exhibition, which both foreground rich notions of the unseen through visual practices. Furthermore, it has been my own personal project over the course of 10 years to explore the most fundamental aspect of human life, breath and air in screen practices through a framework of philosophical and psychoanalytic thought, culminating in my first book, The, the Place of Breath in Cinema. Essentially, the project's concern is with mortality and embodied being. And through this, I ask questions relating to visuality and visibility in narrative and non-narrative cinema. Imagine the sound of breath in a horror film, or the ways in which grainy, shaky images conjure a kind of life force or state of being where lenses appear to breathe, contracting as if the film itself were alive. While this research does not dwell further on contemporary art practices, its introductory chapter begins to find answers to my questions about breath and ways of seeing through the installations of Werner Reiterer, in which one breathes on panels lighting up an installation space. Um, next one. Kim Suja's audio visual performances. Um, which reconfigured her voice and breath as an invisible needle, weaving color and light through the grand space of a Venetian opera house. Here, nothingness becomes something. The immaterial is given flesh. Now, it feels especially timely to return to such experimental spaces through the work of Jarman, Cardiff, and Hepworth in an age in which we are increasingly culturally, politically, socially, reckoning with what might be seen to articulate a new kind of renewed fascination with the non-material world, a wave of mysticism which disturbs the logic of contemporary patriarchal culture. Uh, so this paper um, draws on material that was recently published in my second book, um, Filming the Body in Crisis. Next one. Jarman's Blue, released just a few months before the director's death, is an experimental film, as I'm sure most of you know, consisting entirely of a blue screen accompanied by an elliptical and poetic soundtrack, which largely consists of Jarman's voice as he describes his experience of living with the advancing and debilitating effects of AIDS. The sound of Jarman's voice is both strange and familiar, ancient, and as honeyed and inviting as a relative whispering just behind your shoulder. Jarman exists as both voice and noise, 
two separate entities which, which cross over each other. Gravelly sounds, coughing, singing, humming, sniffing, breaths sometimes indistinguishable from the wind which also fills the soundtrack. Known for his anarchic, playful cinema, Jarman made Blue as his final political act. But it is also intensely personal. It carries his bodily being, inscribed within the film, the only kind of signature he could be faithful to when his fingers became too weak to write. Jarman's films are well known for their ethereal and demonstrative soundtracks, dense with whispers, breaths, poetry read aloud and words neatly dropped into chasms of silence, such as in his um, piece The Angelic Conversation or The Dislocated Voices of War Requiem. Stephen Dillon puts forth the case that sound is a vital compo component of Jarman's lyric films, in which it does not substantiate a three-dimensional real world, but leads the viewer into insubstantial imaginary spaces. For Dylan, oh, next one. The title Blue, and indeed its formal use of colour, also pays homage to the modern art of Yves Klein and his work on the Blue Epoch, which became the inspiration for Jarman's experiments with a blue screen. While Jarman's debt to Klein certainly explains the origins of his conception of Blue, existing criticism of this film has yet to further probe this question of maybe a blue kind of hearing. The most important human body featured in the content of this film is Jarman's, the implicit subject of the film. While Jarman exploits the monotonous visual register of his film, like Klein, to remind us of the experiential qualities of colour, the lack of real, literal images contained in the film, also prefigures the progressive blindness Jarman endured towards the end of his life. Jarman's blue screen does not dramatically change when it is projected in an auditorium, but it does flicker and shudder, reminding us of the apparatus and the film's body. The image is thus projected in its purest form, made visible through colour. No sign of painterly three-dimensional Renaissance space, sets or objects in the frame. Yet changes in the modulation of Jarman's voice, coupled with ambient sounds and varying degrees of pitch and volume, create a depth of perception. Blue offers an alternative kind of embodiment or disembodiment through its blue tones which dazzle and hypnotize viewers. It has hallucinogenic qualities and in this sense it produces a queer disorientation in which the viewer adjusts to a different kind of sight. After 20 minutes at least small changes in light occur so our eyes adjust to st staring at a blue screen. It casts a blue shadow over viewers in the chiaroscuro light of the auditorium and darkness becomes deep azure. Such queer feelings are juxtaposed with the subject matter of the film. Viewers grasp the material qualities of the blue screen and its sensuous aural world. For Luce Irigaray in her book, The Age of the Breath, air is the most fundamental in intersubjective space. It exists between everything, including inside of our bodies, and between the visible objects of the material world. On a literal level, we hear the sound of Jarman's breathing and the wind, waves lapping against a shore and Buddhist prayer chimes. Contextually, Jarman's breath reminds us of the deep breath Tilda Swinton takes in a pastoral setting in his film, The Garden, which both um, announces new beginnings and to a certain extent the first breaths of selfhood before we acquire language. While the content of the film evokes air, it's also suggested through the film experience. The blue screen displaces space as patterns and lights, vision adjusting to the density of colour projected in the air, especially when the film is viewed in the enclosed space of the auditorium. Air becomes tinted in hues of azure, it mingles with dust and light and the sound of silence. 
It is not sound which is privileged over the image. Rather, sound makes present the on-screen absence of Jarman's body, the filmmaker's breathing, his enunciated body or ghosts, um, which um, ghosts the space between film and viewer. Um, next one. In Janet Cardiff's contemporary art installation, The Paradise Institute, viewers are quietly ushered up a staircase and into a mini movie theatre constructed in a hyper-perspective. Stewards hand out headphones and request all mobile phones be turned off. Once inside, viewers sit in the wings above curved rows of empty seats in the lower regions of the auditorium. The film starts and a series of neo-noir images in languishing close-up are projected onto the screen with extra sound effects transmitted in the viewer's headphones. It is as if the ghost of previous audiences have left a residual presence in the empty space. We hear a couple arguing, whispers, shifting in seats. Someone calls out, did you turn the stove off before we left? Then in another direction, why don't you try this popcorn? It's really nice. A mobile phone bleeps and is answered by a young female voice speaking in Spanish. Someone coughs. In interview, Cardiff describes the Paradise Institute experience as something akin to a home movie theatre. Indeed, it creates the feeling of being inside a house through its sense of intimacy and its geography, especially given the centrality of the staircase leading towards a room like an attic space, and its miniature scale. Above all, it reveals the otherwise hidden implications of being engaged at a bodily level with film going, reminding us through the scattered voices of invisible spectators shuffling in their seats of the fact that films do not really exist without the participation of their viewers. Bodies absented within the auditorium as the lights go out and we become nothing but breaths, whispers, Ghosts. The Paradise Institute constitutes a liminal convergence between the bodies of the currently occupied space and those that have gone. While some viewers may laugh at the strangeness and peculiarity of climbing into a mini auditorium and hearing invisible viewers talk about popcorn, it is also a disturbing space because it acknowledges the existence of the apparatus and its viewers, making apparent the distinction between our bodies and those within the diegesis that is seamlessly elided through processes of identification. The Paradise Institute thus brilliantly explores the distinctions between the personal and the depersonalized zone of film viewing. Uh, next one. Similarly, Cardiff has described her piece, The Dark Pool, as an environment which enables us to stir up dusty memories into sounds and stories that can be heard while moving through the space. It, but it also combines a strange library aesthetic with technology. Certainly through its use of sound engineering, the past can be resurrected in this room, forming in the mind of the viewer the image of an archive as cinematic experience, frozen in time. The installation requires a physical and psychological orientation to separately unfolding and looping live narratives in which the protagonist must be located. The material remains we are faced with evoke an uncanny sense of curiosi curiosity and even longing. In particular, the recurrent imagery, imagery of disorderly piles of artifacts, empty chairs, dust, articulates a strange absence that is acutely felt as we become, we become drawn into and moved by the realm of each cinematic narrative. Next one. Along the corridor from the dark pool in the same installation, orchestral music can be heard coming from opera for a small room. The sound suggests a live musical performance starting with the noise of an orchestra warming up and ending with applause. The room itself evokes the clutter and nostalgia of the dark pool, but on a smaller scale. An antique gramophone plays and hundreds of records line the shelves. There is the sound of a man moving and sorting albums, but we cannot enter, but we cannot enter the room. To see and hear his world, 
Audiences have to look through windows, holes in the walls and cracks in the doorways, watching this shadow move around the room. The implied record collector, a middle-aged Canadian man, can be heard talking over the music and his melancholic recollection of moments from his life displaces the listener at once inside the public space of the opera and private den of the music enthusiast. In the exhibition catalogue which accompanies the MoMA installations, Fiona Bradley recalls the famous scene in Wim Wenders' Wings of Desire in which angels move silently through a library in Berlin eavesdropping on the thoughts of its inhabitants. Through her conjuring of Wenders' film, Bradley aptly emphasises the filmic elements of Cardiff's work, showing how it corroborates meaning through its architecture of filmic and archi archival representation. She also foregrounds the intersubjective dimension of such pieces, which require the viewer to perceive their spaces through the eyes of their absent occupants. Her work constitutes dimensions of time and memory, which might be usefully illuminated through Jacques Derrida's concept of um, hauntology, or a hauntological existence, in which the present is constantly imbued with the past, like a ghostly, ghostly figuration of time, or as Stephen Shaviro claims, the uncanny apparition of the spectre forbids us to, so, to make so neat a separation. We are always haunted by ghosts, and we cannot freely choose what we will be haunted by. Both Jarman and Cardiff use sound, light, and the alchemy of art in order to recover, commemorate, or restore a sense of selfhood, subjective experience for themselves as well as the viewers of their work. This is a continual process of contemplation, bodily and psychic engagement, of resistance and reparation, in this sense, the sculptural work of Barbara Hepworth also comes to mind. If Jarman's work invites questions relating to the breathing body of the viewer and the airy spectatorship of cinema, Cardiff's installations represent a dimension of thought which calls on ghostly presences and absences, intimate experiences fleshed out through light and dust. Hepworth also operates along these lines. Her work is full of holes which frame spaces of light, the sky and evoking breathing mouths, at once visceral and tangible, emptied out and yet contained. Um. At last, um, a little bit quicker than the others, I want to think about Hepworth's garden, which parallels Jarman's coastal garden in Dungeness and its play with light, the sea, metallic surfaces, and hand-hewn objects. Of her creative process, Hepworth describes tackling each piece of stone as if she were listening to her own breaths, forming a rhythm of movement as her tentative hands glide back and forth. The stone, in this way, then, becomes an extension of her breathing body, and in turn, serves as a response to the elements around her, their forcefulness, their dark, sepulchral forms pierced by light and wind and air. She carves out a place for breath, for nothingness out of light, out of form and presence. This precise movement between the unseen and the seen is also central to Af Klint's work, and there is a dialogue that exists between these two artists, as well as Jarman and Cardiff. A dialogue which bears witness to an age of resistance to vision as an appropriating power, moving towards a different order of sight, of compassion, selfhood, and self-expression. <laughs> 